so I'd like to talk to you this morning, it is still the morning, isn't it, about driving revenue in the attention economy. So revenue, probably uh, no one needs defining, at least hopefully, we all understand that, but the attention economy may be a new term for people. So what I'm going to start by doing is talking about what we mean by the attention economy that we actually all live in uh, every single day, whether we realise that or not. So to begin, the attention economy. I always like to make these a bit fun at the start to get people's attention, um, so let's talk about 1999. Um, people probably remember this picture, a few laughs. Uh, I certainly remember this picture. 1999, it seems like a long time ago. It was a long time ago. A simpler time, an easier time. Um, feels like the world was a, a, a far simpler place. Um, only 20% of UK households had the internet. I know I certainly didn't. I had to go to school to log on to Hotmail or whatever it was at the time. Um, and, you know, obviously no smartphones, no connectivity of that type either. So very, very disconnected compared to what we have today. Um, hit me baby one more time, um, which now is reverberating around everyone's head. If anyone wants to have an impromptu <laughs> sing song of that, please feel free. It was the best selling single, at least that's what Google tells me. And The Sixth Sense was the big movie of the year. And I, I remember distinctly having the twist at the end of that spoiled for me by my best friend and I still have never really forgiven him. That was 1999, if you can transport yourself back to that time. So imagine you've just come out of um, watching The Sixth Sense, you've got Britney Spears on your headphones and you decide you want to buy a pair. Of shoes. What do you do? Well, you go into the nearest shoe shop, maybe Clark's or I don't know, Office was Office around at the time. You go in and you can look at the shoes on the shelves, and that's what you can pick from. If they don't have your colour, they don't have your colour. If they don't have your size, they don't have your size. If you want to look for some different ones, well, maybe they can order them in, but you've got to fundamentally go to a new physical location if you want different options. You can't just go and find something that you want arbitrarily. You can't see if you've got the best price. You can't see if, as I say, the colour that you want is available, but they just don't have it in stock. You can't see if these shoes are good. You can't look at reviews. Um, you're fundamentally limited in terms of the information you can access by your physical location. That's the point. And now imagine on this very strange walk that you're going on, you're having a strange day, you come out of the shoe shop, a strange man um, comes up to you and asks you who won the Battle of Zappolino. And they say that they'll give you £10 million if you can tell them in the next five minutes who won the Battle of Zappolino. Right? What do you do? Uh, he tells you, by the way, he's being helpful today. It happened on the 15th of November 1325 and it was the only battle in the War of the Oaken Bucket. And that was actually a war about a bucket. That's not just a name, genuinely. It's one of the most obscure military skirmishes in history. Um, so what do you do? You've got five minutes, you can win 10 million pounds, which is probably like 100 million in today's money. Um, so what do you do? Well, maybe you go to the library. Good luck with that. It's super obscure. Uh, I checked and Carter didn't have any information about this back in 1999. You are out of luck. You cannot win this money. Um, you are stuffed. So that's 1999. And let's play back that same slightly odd day today. Apparently these guys were the biggest selling uh, act in 2021. Does anyone know who these people are? Really? I had no idea. It made me feel very old. Um, but today these people apparently were the biggest sellers in 2021. 2021, yeah. 96.6% um, of UK households have internet access. So we've gone from 20% to 96.6. I was actually surprised that the figure wasn't higher. Um, you know, I'd like to meet the 3.4% of people who don't have internet. I mean, I guess my granny. Um, so yeah, this is where we are today. Super connected, loads of stuff going on. And let's play back that same day. So first of all, how do we buy shoes in 2022? Well, partly helped by the pandemic, but in 2021, over 50% of shoe purchases happened purely online. No physical component whatsoever. And it's set to drop a tiny bit this year because obviously we can go back into shops and people do like to browse. But fundamentally, that's gone from 0%, not even an option, 20 years ago to now over 50% of shoe sales. And I think clothing isn't far behind. So what that means is that we're not just limited by our physical location. We can look up, you know, are these the best shoes? What are the reviews saying? Are there better prices? Are there different styles that I can look at? And we do, and we take advantage of that. All that information that surrounds us constantly, we now use to connect us better with product services and, and offers that previously would have been invisible to us. Now if the guy comes up to you and says, who won the Battle of Zappolino? I would do this and I'd Google and show you how quick it is. But if this guy comes up to you, you can easily win his 10 million pounds because you just type it into Google. And Google will find you in 0.58 seconds, 5,200 results. And you can get that basically anywhere in the country. And in case you're interested, the winner was Moderna. Um, it, was, it was between, who was it between? Uh, Moderna and uh, Bologna, uh, I think it was down there. Anyway, you can answer that question super quick, super obs obscure question. Any question under the sun, Google can answer for you in record time. 
so you can win that 10 million pounds. And the point here that I'm trying to make is that we, we as humans adapt to situations incredibly quickly, or, or at least we, we get comfortable with them very quickly. But the point is we're now connected with information services and products in ways that were unimaginable 25 years ago. So 25 years ago, there's the great saying, which is any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And 25 years ago, I think if you'd have shown me, how old would I have been, like 15, 16, something like that. If you'd have shown me a phone that could like play video and look up any fact like that, it would have been mind blowing. It would have been like magic. But yet in 20 years, we've all become incredibly familiar with this and we just accept it. And now our kids grow up and it's just, it's just normal. This is just the way that life is. But now the problem is, is we have too much information. So the goal of IT information technology was to connect us through technology with information. And it's been ruinously successful in that. The point that I've been making over the past five minutes is we're now connected to information products and services in ways that we couldn't have imagined. But now, as is often the case, that solution creates its own problem. We now have too much information. The human race produces 4.4 million blog posts a day. We send 23 billion texts a day and we send 225 billion emails a day, most of which seem to end up in my inbox. We now have way too much information. We're constantly distracted, constantly getting pinged, constantly checking for things. And this is a very familiar uh, picture. Um, everyone always checking their phones, always, you know, normally with headphones in and reading things. And the question is that the, the, the analysis that all of these people are making all the time when they're doing this, if you think about it, is what do I pay attention to? What is worthy of my attention? Because this man here, for example, he could be reading any number of hundreds of news articles or pieces of content from a particular business or checking social or looking at music or looking at things to buy. How does he decide where to place his attention? And does that matter? So to bring this, to bring this home, uh, the big challenge for today is can anyone resist checking their phone for the rest of this talk or indeed in any talks? And that's a joke challenge, don't worry if you need to, but um, it, it, it's to highlight the point. It's such a natural thing for us to just always be checking. Have we been pinged? Have we got a notification? What's going on? It's very, very hard for us to dedicate attention to things in 2022. And it's only going to get harder if people have their way like Elon Musk with implants in our brains and stuff. Um, so the question against this backdrop of attention and the challenge of attention is should businesses care? So I've spent the last few minutes talking about you know, this world that we live in now where you know, constantly everyone's trying to get our attention. Should businesses care, does it matter? Well, the answer is yes, they should. And I could have picked any number of different studies here, but this is one from Densu Wages, who appropriately enough did a study called the attention economy in 2019. The phrase attention economy was actually coined by a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist in uh, 1970. Uh, those guys are always visionaries, um, but this was done in 2019. And what this shows, they did a study to do with advertising. And so along the bottom, you've got the uh, number of seconds that the advert was in view. And up the top, up the y-axis, you've got the stats index, which you can basically think of as someone's propensity to buy. And so what this chart is showing is that if you can get someone to pay 30 seconds attention to an advert, their propensity to buy goes up by, looks like 36, 37%, which is pretty striking, right? Just getting someone's attention, getting them to focus on your message, getting them to focus on what you're saying for 30 seconds, not a huge amount of time, can increase their propensity to buy by 37% on average. This was a major study, like lots of data points, very statistically significant. Attention really matters. And it makes sense because if you don't have someone's attention in a sales context or in any context, how can you expect to build a relationship with them? How can you expect to build trust? How can you expect to do anything? If you don't have someone's attention, it's impossible. You know, people have got to turn around before you, can ha before you can speak to them. And so the question is, have businesses adapted? If we agree, if you, if you agree with what I'm saying, that we now live in this attention economy and um, you know, that matters because without attention you can't sell, you can't grow the business, have businesses really adapted? And predictably, my answer to that is not really. So when I look across the way that businesses communicate, you know, when we, when we speak to companies, um, most businesses are stuck in production. All of their work is spent on producing the messages, on producing the content, on producing the, the materials, on producing the adverts. The actual focus on attention is relatively limited. But the problem with that is that in order to get to what you want, which are the outcomes, you need the attention first. So you need to produce materials, produce messaging, produce campaigns, produce content in the digital world so that people have something to read on their phones and something to engage with. 
But we need to focus on getting attention before we can worry about outcomes. Because I say, without attention, you can't get the outcomes. And the outcomes are the calls to action. Are the leads being generated? Are the revenue being driven? Are the pipeline being created? So attention is the keystone to getting to the outcomes. Because without the attention, you can't get to the end. As I say, most businesses are stuck on that production stage. So my point here in this first little section around the attention economy is that if we're serious about driving better outcomes for our businesses, we first need to focus our attention on getting some attention. And that's what I'd like to talk about next. So the medium and the message, how many people know that phrase? Yeah, nice, good, excellent, there's always a few. So the medium and the message, um, I'm going to start with some unusual ways of explaining the medium and the message. But unusual is always good because it gets people's attention. I want to talk about IKEA. Um, I assume most people have been to IKEA at some point in their lives, probably. So IKEA, you may have noticed when you were there, is not like a normal furniture shop. IKEA looks like this. So they design a very specific way that you have to go around. You can't just go on your own, on your own route. No, 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 they've worked that all out. They've got you going down a very specific route through their showrooms and through their floors. And they place very specific products at very specific places for very specific reasons. And they don't have any natural light because they don't want you to know that time is passing because then you'll spend longer in the store. And the thing that everyone remembers about IKEA is the food. They've got the cafe. So most people know IKEA as the world's biggest furniture retailer, but how many people know that IKEA is also the world's 10th biggest food retailer? That's obvious, right? They sell millions and millions, it may even be billions, of those meatballs. And you can look at that and you can say, well, that's kind of weird. Why does IKEA sell meatballs? But it's not weird, because what IKEA know is that no one wants to go furniture shopping, or not everyone wants to go furniture shopping. But if they put a nice uh, comfort food meal, reasonably priced, at a particular stage in the journey, you're gonna look forward to that. And when someone says, hey, we gotta to go to Ikea today, you don't think, oh man, we gotta go and look at furniture, that's boring. You think, oh yeah, I'm gonna get some of those meatballs. And what they also know is that when you get to the meatballs, they're gonna make you feel good. They're gonna make you feel happy. And when someone's happy and when someone feels good, they're more likely to buy stuff. They're not idiots at Ikea. They've worked all of this out. They understand the psychology. And so the point here is that the message, the, the message that Ikea are trying to get across or the thing that they're trying to get you to do, I suppose, is furniture. They're trying to get you to engage with furniture, pay attention to furniture, make that happen. But the medium through which they're doing it is so cleverly designed and so different to what other people are doing that it's allowed them to become the world's biggest furniture retailer. IKEA and psychology is like an amazing thing. Like they're super smart and it's not an accident, not by any stretch of the imagination. So that's IKEA. Let's talk about The Economist. So this is one of my favorite examples to show. So pricing. Right? Everyone makes decisions on pricing all the time. Everyone looks at prices, everyone assesses them. And I love this example because it shows how crazy human beings are. Okay? This is a bit blurry, apologies. But um, what we're looking at here is, as you can see, it's quite an old Economist pricing page. But you, as the punter coming up to, to buy something from The Economist, you're given three options. Right? You can buy The Economist.com subscription, digital only, for $59. You can buy the print subscription for $125. Or you can go all in and buy the print and web subscription for $125. Those are your three options, okay? And what The Economist found is that, presented with these pricing options, 30% of people would pick the first one, 0% of people would pick the second one, and 70% of people would pick the third one, right? So The Economist, in their infinite wisdom, did the logical, rational thing, and they said, well, look, no one's buying this. Let's get rid of it. So then they did a version of this pricing, which was just the two, like this. And the amazing thing is the percentages flipped. So they found now that 70% of people picked this one, and 30% of people picked this one. Because what this price was doing, although no one was buying it, it was anchoring people to the higher price, and it was making this look more valuable. Because now it's like you're actually you're getting stuff for free here. And so as human beings, we look at that and we say, well, actually, this is a really good deal. I'm going to shoot for this one. You remove that option, we don't have that context and we make a different decision. So it's absolutely nuts. You know, what you're buying hasn't changed, it's just the way that it's packaged. Again, the medium and the message, the pricing, the message hasn't changed, but the medium, the presentation, the means by which it's communicated to us is fundamentally different and that causes very, very different uh, behaviour um, from us weird human beings. Um, what does this have to do with content and marketing and all of those kinds of things, you know, when we think back to those phones? Well, what I'm trying to uh, point out is that context and the medium affect the way in which human beings perceive a message, a service, or a product. Marshall McLuhan, medium is the message, um, hopefully familiar to some people. 
He made this point that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. Think about this, right? Think about the phone in your pocket. Who designed the phone in your pocket? Well, Steve Jobs, Johnny Ive, one of those guys, human beings, right? And now our phones dictate what we do. We're slaves to our phones, let's be honest. Um, and you know, you can, you can make this argument for many other tools and many other things that we do. So Marshall McLuhan's thing here is that human beings, we kind of create straight, straight jackets for ourselves in the way that we innovate and the way that we, we go about creating what we do. And the way that we communicate is no different. So if we think about today's medium, the way that a lot of businesses communicate, at least the majority of businesses that I see, they're trapped in some interesting paradigms. They often think that more words is more value. Oh, this is like a really long piece that's like really great. I've seen like 150 page PDFs and like I just sort of shake my head. More complex is more value. Well, look, we've got really complex wording and like we've really delved into all the details and isn't that great? Everyone's going to love us. Inside out thinking, fundamentally, that's what that is. Looking from what we want to say rather than what the audience wants to hear. We've got to, we've got to consider the audience first. No interaction or engagement. We'll come to that in a bit. Long scrolling pages of text. Hopefully you're building up a picture. Hopefully you've seen this stuff. And the answer at the end is we've always done it this way. When you ask people, why do you do that? Why do you produce that kind of content? Why do you do that kind of messaging? That's just what we always do. And that's a great example of uh, our tools shaping us. We've got so used to producing materials in a particular way that we can't actually see beyond that and, and create anything different. Um, so how much do people actually read? Um, well, th what this chart shows is that um, people past a thousand words, people will only read 12.5% of what you write. So this was a big study done in 2008, uh, and what they showed is this relationship here between the number of words and what people read. I'm going to have to go quickly, sorry. Um, what do people actually read? Um, this chart is the Flesh uh, reading score um, system. Basically what it says is that if you want people to read your stuff, you want a high reading score. So 100 is like Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, 30 is the Affordable Care Act. Um, which one do you want to read? Probably somewhere in the middle. I kind of like somewhere around here, the tipping point, that's kind of interesting. Um, and so what this shows is that if you've got long sentences with complex words, people won't, won't read the thing. It's, it's, it's harder to read. Um, I have some examples here, I'll send the slides around at the end, but some examples of these different things. So you can see the tipping point, as I say, Malcolm Gladwell, very nice and easy to read, score of about 70, Moby Dick, Herman Melville getting slightly more complicated, and then the Affordable Care Act, and if you can wade your way through that, then you're, you're a better man than I am. Um, so fundamentally, um, you know, businesses, when we work with them, uh, you know, running people's content through this, often it's very surprising. The number of businesses that I see producing content that scores worryingly close to the Affordable Care Act is, is disturbing. It's not good. How do people choose what to read? Um, well, think about those people on the train. Um, the more relevant the content is to that individual, the more likely they are to pick that piece of content. If it's irrelevant, if it's boring, if it turns them off. So we did a little study here. We found that just personalizing the front cover of a piece of content creates 41% more engagement because people see it as for them. And it kind of makes sense. We're flooded with information, as I say. If something's got our name on it, and then even better if the content beneath that is more relevant to us because we understand something about that persona or that individual, people are gonna read it more. The more relevant, the more we read. This is really interesting. So interaction, right? So I only, I only learned about this recently. I, I love um, this kind of brain science. But essentially, when, when, you're, when you're thinking, when you're undertaking an activity, your hippocampus is communicating with different parts of your brain, right? And what people have found is that your hippocampus goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. But if the hippocampus is in parallel communicating with multiple different parts of the brain, over time, those different parts of the brain form their own connections. So because the hippocampus is communicating with those different parts in parallel, those, those parts just say, I oh, don't worry about this, we'll just connect ourselves uh, automatically. Like We don't need you to act as like an intermediary, we'll just connect. And that is shown to create deeper memories and uh, greater performance. So when you look at someone who's a real expert in their craft, in their trade, if you think about a great musician or a great writer or a great anything, their brain has wired itself to do that thing because they've practiced so much that these connections are no longer necessary and the different parts of their brain are just communicating directly. It's like really amazing. And so the point here is like if we're getting people to engage with materials or with marketing and it's a passive experience, we're just maybe using one or two modules, we need to get people to think across the whole piece and to use different uh, interactions and different means, different ways of communicating in order to build those deeper relationships and connect the brain up differently. So I'm going to have to whiz through this super quick, but 
a cautionary content tale. So this is a story of a business that um, we worked with. They created a piece of content. You think of that pickaxe on the production side of things. They spent weeks and weeks and weeks and they got 16 seconds average read time. And so what we did is we said, well, we're gonna help you with that. And so we applied some of this thinking. And as I say, this is gonna be a rush to get through, but um, bear with me. <clears throat> so the first thing that we applied is motivation. So there's this idea called self-determination theory in psychology. It looks at why human beings do things. Um, and it's, it distinguishes into two types of motivation. Extrinsic motivation, things we have to do. Intrinsic things we want to do. And what they found through self-determination theory, again, weirdly coming from the 1970s, if you can get someone to experience autonomy, competence, and relatedness, they will do better performance in the activity, they will persist longer, and they will be more creative in their approach. So if we can get someone to experience autonomy, competence, and relatedness, they will engage more. It's kind of what this says. They'll have an intrinsically motivating experience. Good example of this, the uh, share a Coke with campaign. Going to the supermarket, super extrinsically motivating for me. Watch the mic. Um, I only do it so my family don't starve. But Coke have created or did create a little pocket of intrinsic motivation within the R's of Tesco's. And what they did is um, they did this. They put names on the bottles. So think about this. Relatedness, of course, relatedness. These are the names of our friends, our families, our colleagues, our loved ones, all of these kinds of things. We feel related to this thing. There's a degree of autonomy, in fact, a high degree of autonomy, because I can pick a random bottle, I can pick a bottle, I can sit there all day trying to find my wife's name and never find it. Um, there's a huge amount of autonomy. And there's also competence, because when you walk up to this display, you kind of have to realize that there's a little game going on here and you have to use your brain a little bit. So this is quite a good example of self-determination theory in a very unexpected place. And you can apply this, like, you know, if Coke could apply it to buying Coke in Tesco's, like, you know, there are ways to apply it to marketing uh, more broadly. So the first thing that we did on that 16 second piece of content, uh, did they use self-determination theory, autonomy, competence, and relatedness? Unsurprisingly, the answer was a big fat no. Second one, imagery. So we've probably all heard of the picture superiority effect. Various different studies here. Um, I will talk through a few of them. Uh, let's do the first one. So back in the 80s, um, an A-B test. What they did is they gave two groups the same piece of text. They asked them to read it for half an hour, and then they asked them to come back in three days and answer a series of questions about the text. Group A just saw the text. Group B saw the text and some contextual images. So if we were talking about a spaceship, there'd be a picture of a spaceship. Right? And what they found is that group A, who saw just the text, could answer around 10% of the questions accurately three days later. Group B, who'd seen the images, this was 65%. Um, so huge benefit there to images. Similar story here with persuasion. So uh, when people are doing presentations, 3M did this study, they found that uh, just presenting with um, text up on the screen versus with images, people in the audience felt that the, pre the speaker with the image enhanced version was more organized, um, blah, da, 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 but crucially 43% more persuasive. Twitter's own uh, insights show that uh, tweets with images are 94% more likely to be retweeted. So bear that in mind if you're on social media. And there's this amazing thing called blindsight, which I'd love to talk about. But look that up, it's, it's nuts. Basically, some people who can't see can see, which is just mind blowing. Images, bottom line, very, very powerful. So we asked, did the piece of content make good use of imagery? The answer was no, unsurprisingly. So we fixed that. Personalization, we spoke about the, um, you know, the importance of being relevant and all that kind of good stuff. Dale Carnegie, always a great quote. You can always turn to Dale. Um, there's this amazing thing in psychology called the cocktail party effect. And what this is, is that your brain can passively listen to multiple different streams of information. So what happens is you're in a party, or at least hopefully nowadays we can be, and you're having a conversation with someone, but you hear kind of off to the side, your name mentioned. And what my brain does at least, and I always look to see if people can relate to this, maybe I'm just weird. What my brain does is it rents itself in two, trying to listen to what they said and what's that about me, while also simultaneously maintaining eye contact and some kind of sensible, good, a few people nodding. Uh, I'm not just weird. Um, this, so this is the cocktail party effect. And this is the idea that our brains are constantly scanning our environment for relevant information. And we pick it out uh, when we find it, right? And so if you've got a sea of information that's available to you and some of it is personalized and therefore more relevant, your brain is gonna hone in on it, right? It's very interesting. So this is our own numbers. We've seen, as I said before, we did a little test just for fun. We found a 50% lower bounce rate on content if you put someone's name on the front cover, just putting their name on it. We also found that if you personalize, you get 46% more engagement. And in one, in one case where we did deep personalization, we found that people read for eight times longer. So if you think all the way back to that attention, you know, if someone's reading for 30 seconds and now they're reading for four minutes, what does that mean in terms of propensity to buy and our success in the attention economy? 
So we asked, do we treat readers as individuals or uh, as generic, uh, generic people? The final one, the IKEA effect, and this is kind of a bonus, IKEA showing up twice. This idea that labor leads to love. So when you are assembling and cursing the designer of the IKEA furniture, you mightn't believe it, but you're actually building a bond with the chair or with the bed. This is scientifically proven. You may find it unbelievable, but it's true. So what can we do with that in content? Well, maybe we can allow uh, readers to design their own content, like choose your own adventure type thing. And so, you know, you go in and rather than just being presented with a generic piece, well, what are you interested in? Tell us a little bit about you so we can show you something more relevant. Um, so we experimented with that and we saw, you know, did, we, did this piece of content allow our readers to be involved or were they just sort of passive recipients? So what did this do to our 16 second content? You know, I've taken you through some psychology that was applied, 16 seconds, obviously quite a low watermark. Have a think. Um, what do you think that that did to the attention? Anyone want to venture a guess? No. Well, what it did, we're in a hurry. I thought I had 35 minutes. Um, two minutes, 57 seconds. So 1,006% improvement, right? And the thing with that is that's great, but it shouldn't be surprising because the psych like psychology is a real thing. Um, and if we listen to it and if we, if we study it and if we pick out the bits that work, we shouldn't be surprised when it delivers the right result. What was slightly surprising, or at least unexpected, is in free questioning at the end, we did this study with a, you know, one of those companies that like strap things to people's heads to measure these things. Five times more positive brand perception in questioning at the end as well. So not only was the, um, was the, uh, was the content more engaging, it also created a more positive impression on the individuals. Um, conclusion. By changing the medium, we can change how the audience responds to a message. So we saw that with IKEA. We saw that with The Economist, and now we've seen that with even the most sort of usual um, marketing content, it can be done. Um, attention is a means and not an end. I'm gonna skip a few things here, but I will share the slides later. Just to give some examples of people who've, who've been successful in doing this. So Willis Towers Watson, producing content uh, in the usual way, long 150 page PDFs. Uh, and you know, by changing that, by using good psychology, they were able to generate far more engagement and crucially as well, understand how people were reading. And they actually found that they had a market in South America that they didn't know existed because they paid attention to the attention that people were giving through analytics and through content insights. And they were able to find actually there's a market in South America for a particular type of energy future that I'm not gonna pretend I understand that they didn't know existed. So attention, very, very powerful. They're able to drive revenue in a whole new market. Lexus, Lexus um, were launching their first ever electric car. And again, they uh, ditched traditional ways of doing things. They used good psychology and they were able to promote their first ever electric vehicle and drive 80 times more people to their most powerful call to action, which is a car configurator. The Glengarry leads at Lexus are the people who um, have filled in the car configurator. So 80 times more people because they were able to manage people's attention down that particular funnel, get them to that endpoint. And finally, Amazon. So Amazon work an awful lot with a very wide range of people, huge number of um, different types of stakeholders they've got. And they actually use the IKEA effect to great effect um, to drive more engagement. So asking people what they wanted to read, asking about themselves. And through that, they were able to generate more engagement and actually generate more business off the back of that because they had people's attention and they understood people better, et cetera, et cetera. So a few quick examples there. Um, of, of businesses who are using this kind of thinking um, in order to, to drive towards better business outcomes. So in conclusion, if I can run over for one minute, attention matters. If you don't have it, you can't sell. And we all kind of know that intuitively, but it's worth saying, particularly today when we, we have so many things we could pay attention to, how do we get people to pay attention to the things that you know, we need them to in, order to in order to sell? Our legacy tools, in quotes and processes, I believe are holding us back. You know, we're basing what we do off tools which were designed from a particular era. Um, they, they achieve certain results. And it's a little bit like, you know, if, you, if you're still using a feature phone, which is fine, by the way, in 2022, you're being held back from all the other things that you can do with, with more modern approaches. And finally, a little psychology goes a long way. We saw that with IKEA. We saw that with The Economist. Many other examples that could be given. And we also crucially saw it with the 16-second piece of content that kind of, you know, uh, improved dramatically. So apologies for the slight rush there, and apologies for running over, um, but it's an interesting subject and I can't help myself. Um, thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions now I've waffled on, uh, but uh, that's me. Um, thank you very much.